everyone, and welcome to today's webinar presentation, Promoting and Supporting Sleep Health in Families of Infants. My name is Sarah Carsley, and I'm an Applied Public Health Science Specialist at Public Health Ontario, and I have the pleasure of co-moderating today's session. Before we begin with today's presentation, I would like to acknowledge and respect the land, sky, and waters of Ontario, including for their contribution and sharing to support all life within. I acknowledge and respect the treaty unceded and traditional territories of all First Nations across these lands and waters. I would like to acknowledge that I'm in Toronto on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. I acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaties, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Please join me in acknowledgement and respect of all Indigenous peoples, their life journeys and worldviews. May their wisdom always guide our own paths forward with open hands, open hearts, and open minds for the mutual success and benefit of all in Ontario. Lastly, I would also like to acknowledge Daniel Coles, who helped author this land acknowledgement, and thank him for sharing it with us. I'll now mention a few housekeeping items. To enhance the presentation experience, participant audio video has been disabled. The chat pod has also been disabled to limit any distractions during the presentation. Please use the Q&A pod if you have any questions during the session. A discussion and question period will follow the presentation. If at any point during the session you experience any technical issues, please email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. I would now like to introduce my co-moderator for today, Dr. Susan Jack. Dr. Jack is a professor in the School of Nursing at McMaster University and is the lead for the Public Health Nursing Practice Research and Education Program. Over to you, Sue. Great, thank you, Sarah. Good morning to everyone. I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to be here today uh, for this extended PHN prep webinar. And this webinar has really been developed and coordinated and requested by the Public Health Nursing um, uh, Sleep and Activity Working Group here in Ontario. And this working group includes um, many public health nurses who are really passionate around the topic of sleep. It's chaired by um, Anya Cahill, who's a public health nurse at KFLNA Public Health Unit in Kingston. Um, supported by Sonia Strom, who's the program manager for PHN Prep. And over the last year, this working group has consulted with our, our guest speaker, and they've been um, working closely um, to develop uh, new nurse education and client-facing materials on sleep, um, working again in close collaboration as well with uh, Niagara Public Health. Um, and so this is, this is some this webinar is going to start to provide some foundational information uh, to remind everyone or to update our knowledge around sleep and a bit of a precursor to these materials that will be rolled out to um, uh, nurses working in the NFP, Nurse Family Partnership and Healthy Babies, Healthy Children programs in Ontario in the, in the fall. So just a bit of a teaser of what's to come. And so now it's really my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. In planning for this webinar, when we heard from the field that more, more knowledge um, around sleep uh, was required, we did a search. And in every search and everyone that we talked to, when we said, who can teach and speak about um, uh, practice in the community and public health nursing practice and is knowledgeable about infant sleep, one name came up time and time again. So it's really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Keyes, uh, who is a registered nurse. She's an assistant professor at the School of Nursing at the University of British Columbia Okanagan um, campus in Kelowna. And she's the Michael Smith Health Research BC Scholar and holds adjunct positions in the School of Nursing, um, both at Dalhousie and at the University of Calgary. And her clinical background is in school, community, and public health nursing. And the goal of her program of research is to promote and maintain infant and parental mental health by supporting parent-child interactions and sleep health using innovative models of care such as e-health. Uh, so Elizabeth, I turn it over to you and thank you for being here and, um, and welcome. 
Thanks very much, Dr. Jack. It is really a pleasure to be here. Um, and I was really excited to receive the invitation um, because when I first started uh, getting into research, um, my, my mission was to help um, create ways that nurses could support families in sleep health. So um, I guess I can retire now, maybe. <laughs> No, no, there's still lots of work to do. Um, so I just, I'd like to start off with a few acknowledgements. Um, so this is my work, um, uh, you know, created by myself. Um, in recognition of my role in truth and reconciliation, I'd also like to recognize uh, where I'm coming from and who I'm at, who I am. So uh, I'm speaking to you uh, today as a nurse, a researcher, um, but also as a, a woman, a mother, daughter, sister, um, teacher, and lifelong learner. And the more that you um, find out that you, the more you get into a field, the more you find out that you don't know. So I, I really hold true to that. Uh, I'm a white settler who was born and raised and completed all my education and worked um, in both in public health um, at the start of my nursing career in well child clinics and school health. Um, and, and that was uh, located in what's now known as Calgary, uh, located on the traditional uh, territories of the peoples of Treaty 7, which include the Blackfoot Confederacy, uh, comprised of the Siksika, uh, Pekani, and the Kenai First Nations, as well as the Satina First Nation, the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bear Paw, Bears Paw and Good Stony First Nations, and also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Districts 5 and 6. And this is where I had the privilege of completing all my education um, in, in nursing, as well as my nursing practice, uh, starting off there. Um, and then since then, I've traveled to a few <laughs> different places, um, but now I've landed in the Okanagan in British Columbia, which is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Silex Okanagan peoples. And um, oops, this uh, picture here uh, on the left is me a long time ago. And then on the right is a picture of um, a balsam arrowroot flower, uh, which is a local kind of sign of spring, which will hopefully come soon. And they just cover the whole like hillsides. It's really beautiful. Um, and it just reminds me that I'm grateful um, to the First Nations who have nurtured and cared for the lands and waters um, for, around us for all time. I'd also like to acknowledge that um, I have benefited from living and working in a system that's done much harm to Indigenous people and the ongoing work that's needed. And I think this starts to really tie in um, to nursing practice and, and um, is an important part of, of my learning and is relevant for today. Um, we in BC have the In Plain Sight report, which documents the harms. And one of those harms is the prevalence prevalence of the bad parent stereotype of Indigenous people, um, with Indigenous respondents being seven times more likely than non-Indigenous um, respondents to report that healthcare staff always treated them as if they are bad parents. And in the area of early childhood and sleep, I think um, this is really relevant. And so since most of my work involves parents, this uh, kind of grounds me and, and I continually question whether or not I'm contributing to that stereotype or not in my work um, and and trying uh, continuously to strive um, to not do that. I'd also like to acknowledge some terminology. So historically, much of this research in maternal child health has focused on maternal child <laughs> and uh, mothers uh, or people who identify as women who are parents. Um, and I, I might use that term in this presentation just to accurately represent some of the, the research that was done. When they say parents, they sometimes only mean mothers. Um, but I'd just like to acknowledge that, you know, that's not the only type of parent. Uh, and um, also similarly, I might use fathers, but also acknowledging that that uh, should include, um, it should not limit our idea of who can be a parenting partner. And finally, I just like to also uh, acknowledge that the like historically much of the evidence in pediatric sleep has been informed by medical and psychology disciplines, um, as well as a colonial or westernized perspective. Um, and there's growing recognition about um, that our perspectives and biases do indeed shape the evidence, um, no matter how objective you can um, strive for, kind of your position and your 
your background will influence the research that you do. And so I'm really happy uh, to be representing nursing on many interdisciplinary research teams uh, as we develop kind of new, new research and ask new questions. The last thing I'd like to acknowledge is that the parents and families who experience sleep uh, difficulties, and this is a quote from a um, uh, an individual who wanted to be, who was uh, emailing me about my research, and she she talks, it hits me in three ways. Um, one is that she says, we don't know how and why would we? And so that really sticks with me in terms of there is quite a knowledge gap. Um, parents are really wanting some information and guidance, um, despite the fact that there's a huge amount of information available to them. And that comes up in the, the second part of this quote, I have bought books and books, and still I'm in this position of needing to, you know, more information or having problems. Um, so they're really actively trying and looking at what's available. And then the third thing that sticks out to me is this idea that um, the parental guilt, and I created them with the lack of education and knowledge on the topic. And so I think when I approach um, kind of doing my nursing practice regarding infant sleep, I, I always try to keep that in mind that people are doing the best that they can do and they're wanting the best for their, their children, but they're also feeling like they, they're, they're guilty and, and at fault. And I, I try to present ways that um, might, you know, not contribute to that. So today's uh, learning objectives, uh, there's kind of four key things and I've um, organized the presentation according to that. Um, the first is um, understanding the reciprocal influences between sleep, infant and parental mental health and child and family development. And then um, also being able to, um, I hope you'll be able to consider the key components and strategies for assessing sleep health in families of infants. Um, and then describe a family-centered approach that you can use to address uh, concerns about sleep. And then lastly, uh, help identify appropriate resources and, and other ways that you can continue uh, learning about this topic. And so I've organized the presentation kind of in these four um, categories. So we'll first talk about foundational knowledge for sleep and sleep health, then talk a little bit about assessment, and then supporting how, how nurses could support sleep health in families of infants, and then additional resources and learning. And um, this is a little bit um, like we, an extended webinar, so I'll try to keep it engaging and interesting. Um, and uh, there's a few polls throughout. So at first, though, like in terms of foundational knowledge of sleep, um, what is it? And so everybody does it, but sometimes we're not quite sure exactly, you know, we do we don't really think about what it is. So it's really a, a state that you cannot avoid. Eventually, you will need to, you will fall asleep. Um, infants have active and quiet and in, indeterminate types of sleep compared to adults where you may have heard of it talking about different sleep stages, REM and non-REM. And the point of this kind of um, these bullet points is just to get you thinking about that infants do have a slightly different type of sleep architecture than adults do. And as they start to get to be around six, three to six months, they start to transition to more of those adult stages. So, um, you know, that's, that's built in for them. You can't, you can't change that. It, it is what it is. And then in terms of thinking about uh, different um, different types of sleep as one of several infant states, uh, we can think about uh, the different states and how infants move kind of linearly through from alert states to transitional states, which includes drowsy to sleep states. So you can't just kind of hop over typically. Um, it's important to remember that uh, infants typically transition through these states in somewhat of a linear fashion. So you don't often see an infant going directly from active alert or crying to quiet sleep. So they kind of need some help. Um, especially in the beginning to transition to those things in the right environment. Um, it's not just a, a switch. And then this also brings up the, the myth of sleeping through the night. So there, it's quite funny to me whenever I hear the term of sleeping like a baby, because <laughs> I do not want to sleep like a baby. They typically don't sleep very um, satisfyingly for an adult. And so adults wake up through the night, just like um, you might 
think of babies doing, um, typically as they cycle through their different sleep cycles, which are used, like typically around 90 minutes. Um, and so we've learned as adults to roll over or flip the pillow over or get up and go to the bathroom um, and come back and fall back asleep. And if you're a heavy sleeper, you typically don't remember those things. Um, but if you're a light sleeper, you might you might kind of arouse every time. And then infants similarly will wake up between um, sleep uh, cycles. Uh, however, they're shorter. So we they have more of those, um, I had a colleague who used to call them mini awakes between each cycle. And they start off, they can be documented in the literature any time, like between 20 and 60 minutes. Um, so we can just say about, you know, 30 minutes or so. Um, and then uh, that lengthens as they mature and that sleep architecture um, transitions to more of a um, an adult-based uh, characteristic. So the transition to sleep and falling back to sleep, my point of this is that it's a learned behavior. And so everyone learns to fall back asleep and learn certain conditions that they get used to in terms of falling asleep. I think it also before I get right into the content, just um, provide a, a brief overview of some definition, uh, some different terms you might hear. Um, so sleep health is something we'll get quite a lot into. So it's a it's a construct that includes several kind of sleep related uh, characteristics. I think it's really a good fit for nursing um, in terms of promoting sleep health and what uh, and fits within our our scope of practice. Um, sleep hygiene is is kind of um, refers to sleep related behaviors and environments that promote sleep or high quality sleep. It's a little bit outdated because we don't want to say that um, it's, it's got like a connotation for dirty versus clean. So now we talk more a little bit about um, healthy sleep behaviors or sleep promoting behaviors. Um, sleep pressure, we'll also talk a little bit, but it's essentially the pressure that builds up over periods uh, when people are awake um, that drives, that is one drive for sleep. Uh, it's also known as homeostatic sleep, sleep drive. Uh, sleep regression is an interesting term. It's a popularized term as far as I can tell, and I've done a little digging. Um, it's, it's not really used in the scientific literature. There's no documented or documented uh, sleep regression periods. Um, however, that's been picked up by some um, uh, sleep book authors and then uh, it resonates with parents quite a bit. So uh, whether or not there's something there or not, uh, who knows, but it's, it's not used in the literature. Um, it's sleeping through the night, just to, we'll also talk about that. And it the big message for that is it depends <laughs> on who you ask, what how that's defined. I might use the term insomnia, uh, which is really uh, just a fancy name for difficulties falling and staying asleep, and is talking about behavioral sleep and differentiated from um, other sleep type problems like uh, um, parasomnias or uh, which is like nightmares or sleepwalking um, and uh, breathing based sleep difficulties. So it helps us differentiate that. Oh, sorry about that. And then sleep training, again, is a popularized term, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's typically used to describe behavioral sleep strategies um, that is not limited to uh, extinction-based strategies, such as graduated or modified, modified extinction and camping out, which are sometimes um, camping out is pretty common, but uh, graduated modified extinction, also known as like cry it out. So we'll first talk about sleep health. Um, so in 2014, a researcher came up with this concept to um, that was a little bit different than the previous focus, which was always on sleep disorders and sleep medicine and looking for problems. And it kind of flipped it on, flipped it on its head from talking about, well, what does healthy sleep look like? And they um, described that healthy sleep looks like um, adequate like there's adequate duration for the person, it's happening at appropriate times. Um, there's high efficiency, uh, meaning that when you're trying to sleep, you are spending a lot of that time sleeping. Um, people, you're able to be alert during waking hours. And um, there's a, a reported, like a person reported satisfaction and quality. And um, then this got adapted for pediatric sleep health by some um, quite well-known researchers in the field and that are based in the U.S., uh, Meltzer Williams and Linda 
uh, Williamson and Nadell, and they added, they kind of um, defined all these different pieces, and we'll go into them a little bit in more detail and how they're relevant for um, early childhood. And But they also thought that it was really important to consider the sleep behaviors. When we talk about pediatric sleep health, this um, it's really important to think about the reciprocal influences or back and forth influences between sleep and other things. And for me, my, my program of research is focused on um, the back and forth relationship between infant mental health and parental mental health and how that um, is impacted and impacts uh, sleep, sleep health. Um, and then also the ability of the family to kind of function. So um, I don't think I need to convince too many people that when you're not well rested and you haven't slept well, you don't have a lot of energy in the bank to be the best um, person for for your relationships. And so um, that, that's uh, an emerging area. Here, um, the researchers that adapted that sleep health for the pediatric kind of um, population uh, talk about how it's reciprocally um, in, and there's interactions between um, sleep health and individual child factors, family and school or daycare setting factors, um, and then the neighborhood and broader sociocultural factors. So this, I, there's not going to be a test on this. This is just really to get you thinking of how all these things might interact. Um, specifically, I'll uh, a really good example of this interaction is the interrelationship between sleep and parental depression. Um, and so sleep disturbances can precede sleep or can precede depression symptoms. Um, they can kind of act as a warning signal and or uh, sleep deprivation from uh, either just the, the, the parent themselves or as a result of uh, being disrupted, having disrupted sleep from caring for an infant um, can kind of precipitate depression symptoms. Um, but then depression symptoms can also precede sleep problems. So uh, for example, like high depression symptoms at five months have been found to be associated with increased infant night wakings at nine months um, with uh, that increased risk being two and a half times more likely of children from depression, from uh, mothers who are depressed uh, to, develop, to develop sleep problems. But then other researchers have found that the more depression symptoms, um, the increased likelihood of unsettled uh, sleep in infants, which then increases the likelihood of more depression symptoms and on and on. So it's really kind of this um, circular uh, happening and uh, kind of whirl, um, whirlwind of like just it just keeps building on itself and whether or not uh, sleep or depression is the chicken versus the egg, it's kind of a moot point because it just <laughs> it just cycles. So now I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about each domain of sleep health and um, there we go. And because uh, I think it's a really appropriate uh, concept to guide thinking about sleep in families. And the first thing that I'm going to talk about is duration. So um, here's a little poll. So we have these 24 hour movement guidelines for the early years. Um, we have them actually for all different uh, stages and ages, and they have recommendations about the duration of sleep. So um, this is one of the first 24 hour based activity guidelines in the world, actually. And uh, so give it a thought in terms of what you think the recommended amount of sleep in a 24 hour period for a six month old infant is. So thank you. Uh, so we had, oh, there we go. Oh, sorry. Two windows. There we go. So um, four to, so six months is within that four to 11 month window. And the correct answer is 12 to 16 hours. So the majority of people got that um, correct. However, I'm going to just have a little bit of a, um, uh, caveat in terms of these duration that, that's the set recommended for what kind of links to um, healthy outcomes however it's it's a range it's a fairly big range um, 
And as you can see here, this is a pulled from a couple of articles that looked at sleep duration. And I really like to think of this as the growth, like similar to the growth chart. So, you know, you have a wide range on a growth chart um, of, you know, what can be typical. And um, it's really important to, to think about that you know, for sleep, like babies, a certain baby might not need 14 hours of sleep, they might need 12, or they might need 17. And so kind of anywhere within that window um, can be common. As we look at the, the outcomes that are associated with certain types of sleep duration, kind of, if you get two, if you're kind of on either end of that, that can be sometimes associated with some uh, mental and, and social and emotional um uh, problems, but, you know, generally there's a pretty wide window. All right, it's going back. Um, and so what you can see is the greatest amount of change uh, happens in those first couple months, and then it kind of plateaus, uh, plateaus for total sleep time. Um, and again, here in this other um, uh, graph, you can see like there's a pretty wide variation. Uh, the other caveat is that these uh, these ranges have been developed from studies that historically not been inclusive of all racial and socioeconomic uh, backgrounds. And so um, it's, you know, it's just the best, best guess from what we have the data available. Um, but hopefully as we can make sleep research a little bit more inclusive, um, we can get, you know, representation and see if that holds true in other groups. Um, the next kind of point that I have is uh, about appropriate timing and timing as a, as a key concept in sleep health. And so if I offered you a million dollars right now to instantaneously fall asleep, you could not do it just like a switch. And so that's um, an important thing I think to communicate with families is that they cannot force or wish someone to sleep. So just like um, pooping, like you can't make your baby poop, uh, you cannot force a person to uh, fall asleep. So then what does cause people to fall asleep at certain times? Um, I mentioned this before. So there's that sleep pressure or how long a person has been awake. Um, and in the newborn period, this is really the main driver of sleep. Um, there's also the circadian or body, internal body rhythm that helps um, a guide when people are more able to fall asleep and, and feeling sleepy. And then um, you also, to some extent, need the right environmental conditions. So typically for a lot of us, you know, you might need a bed versus standing up in your kitchen um, to, to a point, of course. So we have the next poll, um, which is by what age has the circadian rhythm usually developed? Great. So um, thanks, everyone. The uh, correct answer is about usually two to three months. Um, so there's a melatonin production. Is Melatonin is a hormone that kind of makes you sleepy. I'm sure you've heard you can buy it if it's, you can buy it as a manufactured product. Um, but it matures into kind of a, a rhythm by about mm, two months or eight weeks. That is a little delayed in preterm infants. Um, and it's thought that during pregnancy, some melatonin might uh, pass through the placenta and might drive some fetal rhythms. Um, but it, but they don't have their own, um, their own rhythm till about two to three months. The other things that also in, are included in this internal rhythm is cortisol production. So it kind of matures into day and nighttime um, patterns, as well as temperature. You might uh, have heard that you have a daily kind of flow to your temperature. And so that also um, develops between two and four months of age. And so all these things um, help uh, contribute to our daily rhythms, which helps guide uh, when we're sleepy. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so in terms of, of timing, um, 
most, oh goodness, sorry, I keep hovering. Um, you can see there's a shift from, you know, less nighttime sleep in the first couple months to um, more nighttime sleep. So more of that 24 hour sleep is moving into the nighttime period versus um, daytime and while daytime sleep is decreasing in those first couple months. So essentially infants are going from kind of around the clock um, sleeping that's really driven by uh, that sleep pressure. Uh, so they wake up, they do some stuff and they get tired and they fall asleep. And then as they mature, their uh, daily rhythm or circadian rhythm helps kind of transition some of that sleep and consolidate it more into the nighttime sleep. Um, now, uh, appropriate timing is socially and culturally informed. However, most um, cultures and societies prefer to have their longest, what we call the longest consolidated sleep period um, at nighttime. So uh, we you know, there's kind of this element of does, does the timing match your social environment? And, and that can sometimes be a mismatch with infants, especially in the first few months. So when, when do infants start sleeping through the night? Um, or, you know, at, so for example, at six months of age, uh, what percentage of infants do you think are sleeping through the night? And this is a true nursing question where it's probably not, you know, you got to find the best answer. <laughs> Great. So many people answered. Um, it depends how you uh, define sleeping through the night. So, so that's, that's correct. Um, also 55% is, uh, is one of the, is one of the correct answers. So um, so between 50 and 75% um, of infants by six months will be sleeping through the night, depending on how you are defining sleeping through the night. So there's a really um, interesting uh, study that was done that had different kind of definitions. So the first definition was, you know, sleeping through the night is just from midnight to 5 a.m. And so that's uh, a little, maybe 75% of infants by six months are doing that. Um, then they said, well, what happens if we define that as, um, you know, just having eight hours of sleep kind of during the nighttime period, and that was closer to, I don't know, 68%. And then the third criteria, which was, you know, sleeping from 10 to, to 6 a.m. Um, was even less, so about 50 55% of infants are doing it by then. So that's, you know, that's a significant amount of infants, but also on the flip side, there's a significant of infants who are not doing that yet. And that's, again, just, you know, developmentally appropriate, um, but can be, depending on the family, quite, um, quite distressing by six months if they're still not uh, getting a good chunk of consolidated sleep during the night. The next um, kind of concept I want to explain is uh, in for pediatric sleep health is high efficiency. And so this talks about um, how much time an, a person actually sleeps compared to the total amount of time that they spend trying to sleep and sleeping. It's used a lot in adults with insomnia or, or sleep problems, um, less so in younger children. But I think it can be really helpful to think about uh, when you're working with families to understand their difficulties. And so in young children, two things um, impact sleep efficiency, um, which is um, sleep latency, a term called sleep latency, which is uh, how long it takes to, you know, get a baby down for sleep or how long it takes a person to fall asleep. So typically this would be from parents who are like ending the bedtime routine to actually getting the, the baby to fall asleep. A typical, um, generally 15 to 30 minutes is considered pretty typical for most people to fall asleep, including um, children. It's a little bit more in the newborn period, so it averages about 40 minutes, um, but then by 12 months, the average is about 22 minutes for um, 12 month old. The other thing that can affect uh, sleep efficiency is uh, nocturnal wakings or nighttime wakings and how how frequent those wakings are as well as how long they are. Um, so typically uh, what we observe is about, um, you know, a one and a one point one, so one hour and um, 10, 
15 minutes, plus or minus one hour uh, for newborns of time that they're spending awake during the night to about um, 20 minutes, I guess, plus or minus 30 minutes for uh, older babies. And so there's quite a range um, of, of what can happen. And it's really, you can connect it with um, sleep uh, timing because um, again, you can't not force someone to fall asleep. So I have an example here that I think uh, might be helpful in terms of thinking about if a baby is ready for sleep and you're trying to put them down for sleep, they're going to have theoretically anyways, uh, a shorter sleep latency. Uh, that's some, And you're going to catch that uh, sleep window or sleep gate. Um, and that's different than if you're trying to put a baby down for sleep and they're actually not physiologically <laughs> ready for sleep, you're going to spend a lot of time trying to convince them to sleep when they're just not able to do it. Um, so that can affect uh, sleep efficiency here. So here we have an example. So let's say it takes baby A 30 minutes to settle for a 40 minute nap. Um, so the sleep efficiency, you can think about it as, okay, there's 40 minutes of actual sleep. Um, and that's the amount of time that they're getting to sleep. And you can divide that by that number plus how long it took them to get into um, falling asleep. So that would be 30 plus 40. So you're essentially calculating their uh, sleep efficiency as 40 divided by seven, 40 minutes divided by 70 minutes equals 0.57, which is 57% sleep efficiency. And when you think about it in terms of baby B, it only took baby B 10 minutes to settle for a 40 minute nap, their sleep efficiency is going to be greater or lower uh, than baby B's or baby A's, sorry. Um, so the way you calculate that, I'll kind of pause and give you a minute to think about, um, you know, does that baby have greater sleep efficiency or not? And what the answer is. I think I have some automatic timing gremlins here in my presentation. So uh, baby B's sleep efficiency is 80%, which is greater than baby A's. So from a pediatric sleep health perspective, when you ask parents, you know, how they're sleeping is, I would, if I was betting on something, I would bet that um, baby A's parents are saying, are having more problems with, with sleep than baby B, if this is a consistent pattern, um, where they're, you know, needing to spend a lot of time settling baby B, and that's because there's, um, and lower sleep efficiency. This can also be with night waking. So people that have lots of night wakings and spending lots of time awake during the night, um, when they think they baby should be sleeping, are going to have lower sleep efficiency and probably going to not be as happy with their um, their child's sleep. As babies grow, they're able to combine these sleep cycles, learn learn to fall back asleep, and um, their their rhythms kind of um, help them to consolidate into longer periods of self-regulated sleep during the nighttime. And so this just shows you this graph um, that from the ages on the bottom, ages one, two, and three months is the time when there's the greatest increase in that longest nighttime sleep period. Um, and so typically by about after three or four months, they're they're having they've made significant gains in in having longer periods of sleep at nighttime. Um, alertness is also part of pediatric sleep health, and so uh, um, this can impact emotional uh, emotional regulation behaviors. And while napping is not typical for older Canadian children and adults. Um, with most children stopping their naps between three and five years of age. Um, babies, it is developmentally appropriate for babies to sleep uh, during the daytime and that uh, decreases as they uh, get older and their, num their, their length of daytime sleep decreases. Uh, so do the length of their naps. So in terms of uh, number of naps, typically between zero and five months, we see roughly averaging three um, per day, but that again can range from one to five. Um, and then older babies, six to 11 months is about two. Um, and that can again range from about one to three, three or four. Um, 
so then if you you think about the periods of wakefulness and you're thinking about okay how much nighttime sleep are they getting and then you subtract that from however much they're getting for their 24 hour sleep um and you know they're getting three or so naps maybe as a four or five month old you can kind of think about well you know then they're probably based on how much time they're sleeping at nighttime and they're sleeping at daytime they're probably going to need to have about 10 hour nine or 10 hours of wakefulness during the daytime and so you can kind of guesstimate um, that their periods of waking um, waking hours is about three and um about three hours between each sleep period during the day. Um, around eight to 12 months, the naps tend, do tend to cluster at 9.30 and 2 p.m., um, but that's not the magic nap time. Uh, it's just what typically happens. So it's it, it's not like a, a certain nap time at 9 a.m. or 8.30 a.m. is good or bad. It's just maybe not as typical as uh, some other babies. And then I think also it's really helpful to think about the sleep timing and sleep window uh, and and watching for the sleep cues um, or disengagement cues. And we'll talk more about that later during those alertness, alertness and wake um, periods. One of the last major concepts I want to talk about is pediatric sleep in pediatric sleep health is the satisfaction and quality aspect. And of course, babies can't really describe their their uh, satisfaction with their sleep to us so we rely on parental reports and typically in the in the literature it's been described that about 20 to 30 percent of parents will rate their infants sleep as a problem for them that usually hangs very closely with the number of night wakings um, sleep latency or the time to fall asleep and the length of that longest sleep period um, they can kind of if we ask people about those factors, we can kind of predict whether or not they'll say their their infant sleep is a problem or not. Um, the top graph or chart here is just showing kind of the distribution. So a lot more common for people to report mild um, or moderate sleep difficulties than, than severe sleep difficulties. This is from a, a research group in Finland. Um, and then on the bottom here, we have hot off the press um, analysis from a cohort of babies born during the pandemic and kind of how their parents have rated uh, sleep problems. So about 25% uh, rate their infant's sleep as a small, moderate, or serious uh, serious problem. Um, and the purple ball bars are at three months, and then the, the blue bars are at 12 months. Um, and so we're actively working on this report uh, now. So uh, might be able to share uh, final findings later, later on in a few months. The other thing to think about, so those those ratings were kind of cross sectional or or specific point in time. And um, the other thing to think about is the patterns of sleep quality over the first year. And so this research is from Australia and showed that there are different kind of patterns of sleep. Pro we'll say sleep problems over the first year with about 25% of infants being fairly settled. So that's this first group. About 27% of infants, um, their parents reporting that they kind of have some problems and they they always have some problems from um, six, nine and 12 months. And then uh, we have two groups that kind of only have problems at either six months or nine months. So they kind of have those problems then and then they resolve. And then about 20% have persistent and severe um, sleep problems. So this, uh, that, that to me is a group that really could use some support, um, you know, in terms of trying to figure out sleep and what's going to work within their families. Um, there was an aspect on pediatric sleep behaviors in, in that sleep health model. And those are just really talking about uh, consistent and regular sleep opportunities um, and routines, um, thinking about sleep onset associations, which is the habits that you learn to fall asleep with, and then avoiding caffeine and exposure to light. So even from parental devices or mobile de devices before and during sleep periods. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, when we talk about supporting sleep health. So 
I, th I wanted to spend some time on outlining and what sleep health might look like in different families and spent a good amount of time for that today. Um, there's a few additional considerations for the perinatal period that I think is important for families. Um, so for instance, uh, lots of people who are pregnant might have difficulties falling and staying asleep in pregnancy. And so how prevalent do you think those symptoms are? We have a poll up. So the most common answer was 60%. It's actually closer to 40%, um, which is highest in, in the third trimester. And this is diagnosable insomnia. Um, so not just kind of mm, sometimes difficulties falling asleep. Um, so, but about 40% of people have um, insomnia um, symptoms uh, that are, clinically relevant uh, in the third trimester. Um, that still happens in the first and second trimesters. Um, but if you think about it in terms of the considerations for the perinatal period, you have a significant proportion of um, pregnant people going into postpartum who are already sleep deprived. And so that um, can be really difficult uh, in terms of managing managing sleep and they actually have sleep problems that are um, preceding the the baby and so uh, infants or newborns um, sleep patterns might even further disrupt that uh, rests of um, rates of restless leg too um, in pregnancy are about 23 percent and that can also cause uh, difficulties falling and staying asleep and um, doesn't necessarily go away uh, and then uh, also a consideration is nighttime infant uh, caregiving is still very gendered. Um, and so the involvement of parenting partners, uh, we know when that does happen, is typically associated with more positive sleep uh, outcomes for both infants and um, the child bearing person or mothers. Um, and so that's helpful to think about um, getting involvement of the parenting partners and support. And then there's also some literature that talks about the goodness of fit between uh, previous uh, prenatal maternal sleep and, and infant sleep. So if um, depending, you know, if uh, mothers who are getting more sleep prior to the birth of their infant um, have more variability in the infant sleep, um, like more inconsistency from night to day um, and longer night wakings, um, they're more likely to get um, to, to show depressive symptoms. Um, whereas for mothers who got less sleep prior to birth, uh, night wakings were associated with less depression symptoms. So there's kind of like this matching between um, the pregnant person's sleep needs and their baby's sleep needs and, uh, and habits. Um, a couple other things that we sometimes talk about, um, but uh, I think it's important to situate is physical activity can uh, might help improve postpartum sleep but findings are really mixed so um i you know if someone can do it that's great but i don't think we need to make people feel guilty for you know the reason why they're not sleeping is because they're not getting enough physical activity in this time period um where it might be more important in other stages of life uh infant night waking uh is not uh significantly related to maternal caffeine intake. So that can be um, guilt assuaging for some. Uh, and then uh, some support, there is some support for DHA consumption or fatty acid consumption in pregnancy reducing um, arousals, but that's pretty uh, only with one study. And, and finally, the other thing to think about is this idea, you know, in pregnancy, uh, there's mutual regulation if you have uh, melatonin passing through the placenta, helping kind of set that daily rhythm. Um, and then once the baby is born, um, you still need a lot of help with that kind of self-regulation and flow through states. And um, 
that grows or that that ability grows um, over the first uh, year or two for um, children to be able to do more self-regulation and it's a work in progress right like there are some adults who still can't self-regulate very appropriately so um, just framing this as a, a continual learning process uh, might be helpful there's a little bit of evidence that um, you know prenatal daily patterns might assist in um, infants uh, development of a daily rhythm but not strong uh, human-based evidence um, but there are some suggestions that you know Routines are good for babies, uh, but some people are more routine based than others. So pregnant people could keep a record of their daily patterns of uh, sleep and activity to kind of reflect on and see how much of a regular rhythm they have. Um, and that might, uh, might help um, find a fit later on. So with that, that's a, a good chunk of the presentation. Um, but the next um, thing that I want to talk about is assessment of sleep health and, and how nurses can uh, think about assessment. Um, and so the first thing that is really important to think about, um, so we'll talk about a few different things. The first thing that's really important to think about is um, if sleep is actually a concern or are they, or are we, or parents kind of creating a concern out of um, certain perspectives. And so uh, relationship building in the family context, I think is really important to, to just talk about here. And this is a quote from one of our research studies where the person was talking about going into a well child clinic visit um, and saying, you know, to be honest, there was a little bit of shame or guilt with it. So I wasn't always honest. And I remember at one of the baby's vaccine appointments, they asked how she was sleeping and she was, this, uh, this parent was just so tired. They didn't want to get into it. They were, they were co-sleeping as a coping strategy for the sleep difficulties. And she just said, oh yeah, she's in our crib. And just that I didn't want, you know, not the lecture necessarily, but that the whole, you know, the crib is safer and the don't recommend co-sleeping. And of course I knew that, but at the time I didn't feel like I had another option. And so in my research, I've have heard from parents that have said like, we just don't ask because we're just sick of getting told, you know, not to do it, but not, um, not being helped in trying to understand a plan of how not to, to co-sleep in a response to um, sleep problems. Um, and so that's a, that's a portion of, of parents that I think, you know, we really need to maintain that uh, relationship and a therapeutic relationship and non-judgmental approach with everybody if, if um, people are going to uh, be honest and access, uh, access services and support. There's a screening tool. It's a, Dr. Judy Owens in the United States developed a mnemonic for primary care providers to screen for sleep. It's called the BEARS um, uh, sleep screening tool. And it is just, you know, you, you ask about bedtime issues, excessive daytime sleepiness, uh, night awakenings, how regular the sleep is and the duration of sleep as well as snoring. Um, and snoring is an indicator that uh, further assessment by a medical professional might be might be needed. But it's kind of a nice way to organize asking about sleep. Um, in terms of, you know, thinking about assessing sleep, it's helpful to remember it back at the start of the presentation when I talked about those reciprocal relationships. And so um, here's a poll. So what factors do you think might be related to sleep? Okay, so um, this is a uh, again a true nursing question. <laughs> so um, they're all they all could be related to sleep, and so most people um, picked up on uh, a lot of those factors. Um, here, you know, this is not an exclusive list, but I've kind of organized it into infant, parental, family, and sociocultural uh, factors to consider um, that I think are important from a broader perspective. It's not 
you know, the be all end all of a list, but um, for infants age and gestational age, temperament, um, any core morbidities in terms of neurodevelopmental feeding or weight gain um, issues are important to know about. Um, the ability, things that might impact the, I, I know a lot of public health nurses in um, Ontario are using the parent-child relationships and the cues um, in terms of trying to coach parents to read and respond appropriately to their infant's cues. And so you might know that there are certain things that impact the infant's ability to provide clear cues and respond to the caregiver. And so that is also um, something that fits into um, sleep health and is important because, again, of that progression from mutual regulation where they're needing parental help to self-regulation. In terms of parent factors, mental health, depression and anxiety, um, parental beliefs about sleep and crying and what that means to them um, is important to understand. History of sleep difficulties in the family, um, medications and any supplements that are being used um, can give you an indicator of, you know, is there also history of, of sleep problems. Um, family, family characteristics, so thinking about the parent-child interactions and relationships and how does that um, either help or hinder maybe sleep health. Um, thinking about the availability and the quality of support from parenting partners and other social supports, uh, family routines and schedules. So, you know, it's family routine and um, a family that has, you know, their first baby might be quite different than the family routines and schedules that need to happen uh, if they have uh, older children in daycare or preschool or kindergarten or school. Uh, it will kind of be structured around that routine. So knowing if there's any kind of family routines or schedules that are happening is helpful. And then home characteristics. So, you know, what what is their seat, uh, sleeping space like? Um, you know, what what's the arrangements in terms of what they can do will help be helpful to know um because that could guide your conversations with trying to figure out a plan and then socio-cultural in terms of again sleep related um beliefs and you know some cultures are quite happy staying up a little bit later and having more daytime sleeping and if that's working for them uh then that's working for them and kind of parenting practices are important and then you know also thinking about you know did daylight savings time just happen and everybody's sleep is is messed up um, snoring, breathing difficulties during sleep, uh, feeding, weight gain concerns, and I think even multiple regulatory concerns are um, uh, red flags for, not red flags, but, you know, really strong indicators that there might be something else going on there, and that needs to be um, assessed because just working on the behaviors is not going to solve those things. So when we think of assessment of sleep, we can think about um, ways of tracking and monitoring sleep. And this uh, can be helpful um, in as an assessment to, tool, but also learning as a learning experience for parents. So um, sometimes when parents are just filling out, they might be like, oh, <laughs> this is happening. And they might have a realization. Um, it's also good because sometimes changes in sleep can be gradual. So kind of tracking it and documenting it uh, can help people realize either they've seen improvements or it's not as bad as they thought it was. And that can help alleviate some guilt or some um, that perception of, of poor quality sleep. Um, there are a number of different kind of hard copy printable app-based versions of sleep diaries. Um, there's different things that can be helpful to include. So if there's start and stop times for sleep periods, the number and length of wakings and how long it took to settle back to sleep and where they fell asleep and how are things that I think are important to include in a, in a sleep kind of diary. Um, but really the usability of whatever they're using is um is kind of key because if they're not using it, you're not going to be able to give any feedback or kind of considerations for it. Um, and, you know, there's lots of consumable consumer wearables that are becoming popular. We don't have a lot of data on reliability and validity, um, but if they're using the same one continuously, then at least that will give you a benchmark. Um, and typically, I think it's most common to see about five days in, in tracking the sleep behaviors to kind of see a, see a pattern. So um, based on, I pulled this, I think this is from a, a 
Ontario based um, uh, group uh, that's created this sleep feed play tracker. And so, you know, I just wanted to give an example and looking on that um, tracker, how many you can think about duration. So how many hours of sleep are they getting? And is that amount typical? Um, you can think about when is the timing um, happening? Like when is the timing of that sleep? And is it appropriate for their developmental stage? Um, so for this, uh, this one, it's a little bit spread throughout as a 24 hour day. Um, if we think about the three months, we're trying to think about, well, their uh, circadian rhythm is just developing. Um, and so we have about 12, um, if they were born preterm and they need to correct their age um, to nine weeks, you know, their rhythm might be a little bit delayed. Uh, you can also think about how much time they're trying to sleep versus actually sleeping. This isn't quite captured on this, um, so that might be something that it needs to be asked about. Um, and then how long are their longest bouts of sleep? So um, that, again, might be something you can ask about in more detail. Um, we can get a little bit of idea. You can also get about an idea of alertness during the day, how, much nap, uh, how many naps they're having, and uh, how much daytime sleep they're getting. And then um, in terms of sleep behaviors, what's happening before sleep, um, we don't really get that. We get that a little bit um, from here, but not um, in terms of we can see sometimes they're just going from play to sleep and sometimes they're going from feeding to sleep. So it's nice to see there's a little bit of variety. And then um, satisfaction and, and quality isn't quite captured by a sleep diary. Um, so that's something that you would have to ask in addition in addition about. We have uh, assessed, we had, there's one sleep questionnaire I just want to introduce um, as a tool that people could use. It's freely and publicly available um, and I'll have the website at the end. Um, it's called the Brief Infant Sleep Questionnaire and it is a tool um, that can be scored but you don't actually have to score it. You can just use it to provide a fairly comprehensive picture of sleep patterns. Um, in terms of infant sleep patterns, caregiver, caregivers' perceptions about sleep and caregiver behavior. So what's happening, you can see, you know, they're being held and rocked usually at bedtime. It just gives you a little bit um, of helpful information. And just like the sleep and activity or the sleep diaries, it's helpful for parents to know um, even just sometimes filling it out, they'll realize, oh, I'm doing all these different things. <laughs> Um, at nighttime, and maybe this is something that I can practice more of. So um, we'll talk now about supporting families to manage sleep health. And I think it's helpful to think about supporting families um, with sleep on a continuum from prevention to treatment, not necessarily prevention versus treatment. And the results in the literature are mixed in terms of prevention interventions. And so I think situating it as a work in progress and learning um, sleep habits can be really uh, helpful. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, I think it's important to engage families in a family-centered approach. And so understanding um, that sleep beliefs, other parental concerns, and the goals for sleep, and then trying to work with families to come up with a, a strategy and a plan that's going to fit for them and that they can use consistently. Um, because if they can't use it consistently, it's not going to work. And so there is no one magic fix for sleep, um, except I would say coming up with a consistent plan or a plan that uh, families can do consistently. And then situating sleep um, concerns within the broader family context can help um, can help you work with families to prioritize different concerns and approaches. So I want to introduce the idea of the stepped approach, and it was first introduced actually as a model for adult insomnia, but has been uh, adapted for children. Um, and I think it can be kind of useful for nursing practice when working with infants. So it spans a little bit of prevention and promotion, which are kind of step one and two, to more management and treatment, which would be steps three and four. So step one is really just talking about educationally education about developmentally appropriate sleep patterns. And you can integrate that information from sleep assessments or sleep diaries in terms of thinking about, you know, it, most parents want to know if their baby is sleeping enough and is normal or typical. Um, 
I think it's really important to acknowledge that many parents are already accessing information um, and experiencing this information overwhelm. Um, and so the top the top sources of information are friends, families, parenting websites, sleep books, and online forums and, and chat rooms. Um, many uh, parents will also access public health nurses, this is in Alberta, or their family physician and social media. And so you get a lot of differing information for that. And one of the things that was key for families in one of my research studies to um, to help improve their uh, infant sleep was sorting through that information overwhelm and having actually a nurse or someone reliable who they could uh, do that with. And then the other thing to think about is activating positive social supports. So just like routines are good for everyone, positive social supports are good for everyone. It's kind of like skin to skin care. It's really um, protective in terms of mental health. And so thinking about how um, families can engage different types of supports is really helpful. Step two uh, is talking about those health, healthy sleep promoting behaviors and routines. So um, as I just mentioned, routines are good for everybody, typically, especially babies. And so this includes daytime routines, um, which are different than daytime schedules. So daytime routines are really based on um, kind of a flow rather than a time or clock. And so developing a good daytime routine and rhythm can be really helpful. Um, and then it is effective. There's seen um, a good amount of research by uh Dr. Jody Mandel and her group that talk about you know, even just implementing a consistent pre-sleep routine can improve infant sleep. And the more consistent that routine is, the, the, um, the more improvements you'll probably see uh, for sleep. So that's really setting up a bedtime uh, routine or pre-sleep routine, which helps um, infants learn that and coach their body and their internal rhythm that it's time for sleep. However, this can really be difficult for um, for parents because they're already so tired and it's really hard to um, be consistent with that. So then going back to step one, which is active social supports and thinking about how you're going to be able to actually implement that is really helpful. And this quote, you know, just talks about, you know, you can't see the long-term results sometime, like you want the long-term results, but you got to deal with the short-term bits. And so um, working with families to kind of come up with how they might overcome that, you know, um, short-term, uh, it can be really hard to implement those routines, but uh, getting through that, uh, because that could be, be enough. Another thing to think about is uh, step um, in a step is health promoting behaviors. And so Dr. Penny Corkum um, has developed the ABCs of sleeping as a mnemonic for kind of healthy behaviors. And uh, we've done some work in adapting that for um, infants in terms of if it is appropriate. So, um, you know, infants aren't necessarily going to get exercise, but they could come out of their infant seats uh, for a certain amount of time um, and thinking about, you know, they might not have their own iPad, but the parents might um, be on their phones during the bedtime routine. And so thinking about no electronics, et, et cetera. And so thinking about setting up those uh, healthy sleep behaviors. The other thing that I mentioned in terms of routines is the importance of cue-based care. And um, I, I don't think we quite have enough time to watch this video today, I'm sorry, um, but I uh, can certainly provide the link and some information, but thinking about um, providing cue-based care that is appropriate and responsive to the infant's needs. And so this is from a study that talks about um, infants wake up and resettle back to sleep without direct parental contact as early as five weeks, and then uh, also like continuing on to three months. And so this idea of just watching and waiting and seeing, um, you know, how to respond to um, the infant's cues, do they actually need parental intervention or feeding, or are they just resettling themselves? And we've done some work um, in terms of early sleep cues and thinking about um, coaching parents to read and respond for early uh, sleep cues to be able to differentiate uh, sleep-related cues and the more subtle disengagement cues that might 
cluster and build up and signal the need for sleep. Um, and so this can help uh, reduce uh, nighttime wakefulness uh, when, when we, they have this coaching on this cues and appropriate cues in combination with education on sleep. So we have a poll here. I think this is our last one, which is the subtle disengagement cues. Great, so most uh, people got them all right. So actually these are all kind of subtle disengagement cues that might signal the need for sleep. And um, these, if not, if that cue isn't um, attended to, uh, will progress into uh, potent cues, which is more um, like crying, irritable, back arching, some of those bigger, um, bigger types of cues where the baby will need more help to come down and regulate themselves so that they can then fall back asleep. And so catching, catching these earlier cues can be quite helpful in terms of having that um, kind of hitting that sweet spot of helping babies fall back asleep more easily. And uh, when we did this, we did see a reduction in nighttime uh, wakings. It wasn't quite powered, uh, our study. Um, so we didn't see significant uh, results in terms of the number of nighttime wakings, but we did see quite significant reductions um, when we taught this to parents um, in terms of how uh, their reports of how long the baby was awake during the nighttime. So I think this is a really promising um, route to go for, for many families and also has benefits in general in terms of just improving um, and helping optimize parent-child interactions. Step three would be more of the behavioral based strategies. So once we have routines, once we're sure that, um, you know, the baby, we're offering sleep opportunities to sleep at the, you know, at the appropriate times for, for babies. Um, I think then it's a discussion with families and informed discussion and decision making about, you know, what kind of other behavioral based strategies, if there's still a problem, um, might they want to use. And so these can range from more direct, like graduated extinction, where um, there's periods where essentially what the, the goal is, is to learn or to have new sleep associations. Um, and so you're trying to create situations where the infant falls asleep by themselves or with less parental intervention. And so that's a, that would be graduated extinction where there's periods you can go in and check um, between preset periods. So it could be five, seven, 10 minutes um, where they go in and offer them and they offer reassurance um, to more gradual um, methods where maybe the parent doesn't leave the room, but provides just, you know, rather than rocking, um, they might just hold them. And then once they're falling asleep while they're holding them, they fall asleep, uh, they um, move to the next step, which would be falling asleep, maybe in in their own sleeping space but still with parental presence and just kind of much more gradually increments um, of new learning of sleep associations um i think it's really important to think about and have conversations with families about what sleep associations are going to be sustainable um, and thinking about you can introduce new ones before removing the more unsustainable ones. Um, so for instance, white noise is one that you can introduce um, before removing, say, feeding to feeding to sleep, which is quite a powerful sleep association. Um, but really thinking that it takes repetition to learn new habits. And so that repetition, infants need consistency with it and working with families to develop a plan for learning that new, new habit. Um, just to note, like, so behavioral strategies in the literature are, have, like, pretty effective in reducing parent reported wakings, which means that the infant is not telling the parents that they are waking up, they're falling back to sleep without doing that. Um, there's no evidence uh, in the literature to date or high quality evidence of long term negative effects to those approaches. Um, however, that being said, you know, all the research has been done from certain uh, perspectives. And so, um, you know, 
continuing to, to do more studies on this. However, I suspect if there was a significant um, clinical effect, like a significant effect size, we probably would have picked something up by now. Um, there are concerns, though, about implementing these strategies before six months of age, which is why I think uh, working on the kind of stepped approach and working from prevention to um, more management or treatment is nice because those step one and step two can be something that happens before um, six months. Uh, and then I think it's also really important to think about that parents are already implementing these strategies with no supports with a lot of mixed success before six months. And so opening up those conversations um, and working with families rather than avoiding the conversations because we don't know what to do um, can be really helpful in terms of providing um, family supports for, for the, what the families are needing. Um, so again, like the approach that families can consistently use is likely the best one. Uh, working together, if there's a parenting couple and coming up with a plan that both parents are uh, comfortable with and can do together can be really helpful. And I think this is a really nice opportunity to incorporate the ORS model, um, which has been done by PHN Prep and I think presented on um, in terms of figuring out a plan that works with families. And then lastly is the consideration for specialized care and or further assessment. So um, if you remember at the beginning um, when we talked about sleep problems, there's that 20% or so of infants that pers uh, may experience persistent and severe infant sleep problems. And I bet you those parents are really trying to do everything they can and there's a lot of other stuff going on and they probably are needing quite a bit of support so especially for those families that are having persistent um, and severe infant um, or reporting uh, sleep problems I think um, those families really you know need a little bit more support than we can have than we have right now because um that group is associated with quite a bit of increased in um, problematic emotional symptoms at four and 10 years of age, those infants, um, as well as infants who are having multiple regulatory difficulties. So difficulties with crying, with sleep, with feeding, they have a three times chance of more clinically significant mental health at five and 11 years. And so I think that's really important to think about in terms of prevention of mental health um, difficulties. And so what options are there? Um, so the, the fact is that there might be underlying issues that need further investigations or more specialized care. So again, sleep-related breathing issues, weight feeding difficulties, significant mental health issues. So parents are having intrusive thoughts or um, really unhelpful thoughts about, um, you know, their identity as a parent and what, and that's hindering them to come up with a plan or kind of, um, not allowing them to come up with a plan. Sorry about that. Um, that's when it's time to, to make a further assessment. This is a map of all the pediatric special um, specialty clinics in Canada. So there's not a lot, and they're usually associated with a major urban center or academic center. Um, but typically the first step would be to um, encourage a family, like a a medical assessment or family physician, NP or pediatrician, um, sometimes a clinical psychologist, um, because you usually need those people to make the referrals to the to the sleep clinics um, in the children's hospitals, which would be kind of the highest form of care. Um, in terms of just additional resources, I'm just going to wrap up here in the last couple of minutes. Um, we will be pre uh, preparing like a PHN prep printed or uh, printable resource. Um, that will follow up with some of the information in this presentation. Um, we also have a new Canadian Sleep Research Consortium that has a whole section on uh, healthcare providers and resources. So there's two webinars. Um, one is a really excellent webinar that will blow your mind about how we think about sleep by Dr. Amy Schwanda, who's an assistant professor at McGill um, on Indigenous sleep knowledge and kind of just different ways of thinking about sleep. Um, and I also have a webinar up there on just parental experiences during early childhood of sleep. 
uh, we have a lots of ongoing um, new research in in Canadian sleep research. So my lab is the Sleep Solutions to Promote Better Early Childhood Relationships. And if you're interested in learning more, we have several big projects uh, on the go. There's a QR there code for the website. Um, and so like, please reach out because we're, I think the sleep research community is doing a active, um, trying to actively talk to more people and get out information from sleep researchers and, and clinicians to um, primary care providers and allied health. And then there's a few different additional um, like professional societies. So the International Pediatric Sleep Society, the Pediatric Sleep Council is where you can get that brief uh, downloadable um, brief infant sleep questionnaire. It's got lots of other information too and snippets for members of the public. And then nationally, we have Canadian Sleep Society sleep on it. And there's a, a few books that you might help find helpful. So I'm just going to close with this um, kind of blog, which um, or post from a blog, which just, I think, really situates where families, all that information they're getting. So, you know, sometimes it can feel like a no-win situation. So, for example, put the baby in a nursery, bed in your room, in your bed. Co-sleeping is the best way to get sleep, but don't do it uh, because it can kill your baby. So, if your baby doesn't die, you will need to bed share until college. Um, you know, keep the warm room warm, but not too warm. Swaddle the baby tightly, but not too tightly. Um, don't let your baby sleep too long, except when they've napped too much. And so this just really, I love this. It's um, Nyer, I think it, it wrote it, and we have um, the, the link on the slide there. But, you know, it, it just, it really captures all the contrasting um, information and advice. So sleep when the baby sleeps, clean when the baby cleans. Don't worry, stress can cause your baby stress, and a stressed baby won't sleep. And I think this is really where nursing can make a big impact in helping families sift through all this information and come up with a plan that's going to work really well, um, well for the family and family feels good about doing um, and providing support uh, from that perspective. So with that, I will uh, close today's um, the presentation. We can uh, open it up for Q and A, and um, yeah. Oh, great. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth. I mean, so much information and um, really appreciate you providing us an update on the most current evidence, as well as some really uh, thoughtful strategies for assessment and, um, and talking to parents um, in thinking about different approaches to sleep. And as always, I think we could spend a whole day with all of our speakers when I look at the number of questions. Um, but I want to assure everyone that these videos are, are recorded, they'll be archived to share so you can access the resources. Um, over the next few months, we will be developing those PHN prep resources that um, we'll have some specialized ones for um, the HBHC and NFP teams um, in Ontario, as well as some publicly available resources. So we know we'll summarize a lot of this. Now, one of the questions, the first questions I'm going to ask you is, is probably a question I had when I was first a public health nurse in Edmonton and probably about 1993, and it's still being asked, so I think it's important to ask it. Um, I often feel like some parents think if they give their baby formula versus breastfeeding that their baby's going to sleep longer. Is there any research to support this or are parents just trying to convince themselves that this is true? There's like a little bit of research that says like in pe uh, babies who are fed formula might sleep a little bit longer, but it's it, it's not huge amounts that are going to make the difference between the eat and be all and end all. Really, the thing that's going to make the most amount of difference is whether or not you're formula feeding or or um, providing supplementation or or you know breastfeeding um, is the you know um, feeding to sleep is a really strong sleep association the babies really love that it's really hard um to 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 stop that and that i think is even more important than what the baby is is eating or ingesting so if you can build some skills and practice some skills that involve other ways of falling asleep would be really the most impactful thing Okay, and this is uh, another question from someone else, but I think it'll nicely link with what you've just ended with. Um, when is it recommended that a pre-sleep routine be initiated, the age of the child, 
And um, if you were put yourself in the place of a nurse, what would be some quick tips or strategies that a nurse could share with a parent around what a pre-sleep routine should look like or how long it should take probably with, you know, within that six to 12 month or that infant yeah. age. So you can, I, the thing I love about routines is <laughs> parents can start learning their routine for themselves. Cause if you go back, some parents are very routine based people and some parents are not routine based people. So you can start even a really short pre-sleep routine, you know, right from the, as soon as you can get your head around it in the first couple of months and then start practicing that. I think if you can practice that between three and six months, that is really, really helpful in terms of um, things that are helpful to include in that um, routine or kind of characteristics like, a, you know, 15 to 20 minute routine is, is pretty good. If it goes much longer than 30 minutes, there's just too much stuff happening and the baby's not going to be able to connect it all with that falling asleep in those environmental cues. Um, nap pre-sleep routines, you can kind of have a condensed version of that to kind of hit that window a little bit in a more timely fashion. Um, and so things like, you know, cuddling, providing like nice, warm, responsive parenting during that re um, routine is actually can um, related to better sleep. Um, so really responsive routines um, and doing something that fits with the family. So figuring out like, what do you like? What does the baby like? If the baby doesn't like a bath and it like over excites them and they don't like it, like, don't do it. You don't need to, you don't need to do it. So finding out some activities that are short, that involve some warmth and um, uh, interaction, I think are the good things. Um, and Elizabeth, I, and just looking at a few questions here, and I was really struck by some of the comments that you had around tensions that parents experience. And even in my own research, I've, I've heard from participants in research, you know, well, we don't tell the nurse X because we don't want to lecture. And, and I think in, in nursing, um, how do we create space where we always say we, we want to provide non judgmental care and we're always balancing safety evidence, but also the desire truly to provide parent or or person centered care right I, I believe that is the goal of of nurses and clinicians, but again, we always have evidence and safety in the back of our mind. And we don't want to leave situations where someone feels like they can't share their truth their experience with us. And so I think this is work that we need to do um, as nurses. And so this one question is really around, well, first, is there evidence on bed sharing and sleep efficiency? But knowing that there are families that are bed sharing, um, what does nurse education or a harm reduction approach look like or sound like around bed sharing? Yeah, um, so I think it's important to realize and recognize that there are kind of two groups of people who are bed sharing there's a group of people that you know it's culturally or it's from their parent philosophy and that's what they want to do and and so you know in terms of like coming up with family choices and family um like you know realistic and being meaningful like you can't ignore that away or you can't wish it away if that's what they're going to do that's what they're going to do um but then there's also a group of parents that um use that as a coping strategy because they are so tired and they don't know what else to do and so I think you know at the first step like kind of figuring that out um is is a first step and I have lost my train of thought um in um, terms of yeah. yeah and so thinking about you know what is um what is actual goals like do parents want want to do that or do they not want to do that and they're just doing that because they're um sleeping so i think the path will differentiate based on like maybe you work more on sleep strategies versus maybe you work on um kind of providing them with information about you know what they can what they should consider if they if they are doing that practice i also recently have thought about this idea of like co-sleeping and harm reduction and labeling harm reduction for co-sleeping as a pretty like thinking about equity and inclusion and diversity and like are are we really labeling someone's culturally appropriate parenting practice that involves co-sleeping as we us needing to do harm 
reduction mm-hmm. because they may see harms very differently in talking with a colleague. Um, you know, if, for instance, like if they're in an unsafe housing situation, it might like, and we're saying, oh, we need to do harm reduction because you're co-sleeping and they're co-sleeping to like provide safety and security for that baby. Like it's, it's just a whole kind of different mind shift. So I think, you know, thinking about how we can make um, plans that are culturally inclusive and humble, um, I would like to go that route before thinking about it as harm reduction. That's probably a whole other I, webinar. <laughs> you know, it is. And I, I think as all of us on this call really think about um, adapting our practice to align with equity-oriented principles of care or trauma and violence-informed care, there's some deep reflection that needs to occur around what we do around topics such as breastfeeding and sleep. I, I do, it might be time for a bit of a revolution. I don't know. Or rebellion. Well, and like, if you, <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of, I mean, public health has is intertwined with uh legality yeah and i think that can sometimes really hinder us when we're worried about well if we say something like we're more worried about the legal implications than creating like meaningful talks exactly well and on that note we're going to end there's more (laughs) there's more than 25 more questions so amanda if you can hear me amanda please copy and paste all the questions that are remaining and elizabeth as we continue to develop the sleep resources in partnership with you i'm gonna we're gonna look at all these questions and ensure that we embed answers um just and if in 10 seconds there's been quite a few questions around resources for parents is there a a reliable evidence-based resource or app that people can refer parents to do you know one off the top of your head the babysleep.com is probably the most one it is still a little bit not enough for some people so it's still a little bit like parents always want more specific yeah. personalized information and I would say that's a work in progress so stay tuned because that's one of my missions okay excellent well thank you everyone thank you Elizabeth for joining us today thank you Sarah for uh, co-moderating with me everyone if you're still on there will be an evaluation we ask you to complete the evaluation um, the presentation will be archived and people will be able to access, see the slides through the archive uh, within a few weeks. And stay tuned in March and April, we have two amazing speakers from the University of Toronto um, who are going to come and uh, for two webinars speak about special considerations around um, uh, delivering perinatal care as well as, well as perinatal mental health care uh, to LGBTQ2S plus um, um, pregnant individuals and families with young children. So really excited to uh, to learn over the next few months. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Elizabeth, and have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye.